Hi, everyone. I am Trevor Morrison. I'm the Dean of NYU School of Law, uh, and I'm also a faculty co-director of the ReCenter on Law and Security. And I want to welcome all of you to today's event, uh, a book talk featuring Congresswoman Jane Harmon in conversation with Professor Andrew Weissman about Congresswoman Harmon's new book, Insanity Defense, Why Our Failure to Confront Hard National Security Problems Makes Us Less Safe. Um, now, this event is uh, co-hosted today by the Reese Center, as well as NYU's uh, Washington, D.C. Center. Uh, we are grateful, as always, to Rick Reese, in particular, um, our great supporter of the Center and graduate of the law school. Thank you, Rick, for everything you do to support the work of the Center. Um, the Reese Center's research areas are really focused on the domestic law, policy, and process of U.S. national security including classic questions of separations of power and war making authority involving the war powers resolution, et cetera. Um, we are very pleased that we can welcome Congresswoman Harmon here, uh, given the fact that she has devoted so much of her career to important work in this exact space, uh, including, of course, the important role and responsibilities of Congress in national security law and policy making. The timing of this discussion is particularly apt with the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks um, just a few months away. Um, Congresswoman Harmon served nine terms in Congress representing California's 36th district. She was the ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee and served also on the House Arm Armed Services and Homeland Security Committees. Um, she's the first female director, president and CEO at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars. Uh, having served there since 2011, and is a current member of the Aspen Strategy Group on the advisory board of the Munich Security Conference and co-chair of the Homeland Security Experts Group. Andrew Weissman is a professor of practice here at NYU School of Law, where he's also affiliated with the Reese Center on Law and Security as a distinguished senior fellow and with the Center on the Administration of Criminal Law. He, of course, is known to many of you, having been one of the most prominent uh, federal prosecutors to serve uh, the United States in recent decades, was a lead prosecutor in the Mueller special counsel team, former chief of the fraud section in the Department of Justice and general counsel of the FBI as well. Um, we're thrilled that Andrew is a part of our community as a, a professor of practice on our faculty. With that, I'll turn things over to Andrew who will begin the conversation. Great, um, thank you so much, Dean Parson. Um, this is such a great honor and privilege, and it's so great to have you here, um, at least virtually, um, at NYU. So welcome, and um, let me let me start with a softball question, Congresswoman. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure you, you can anticipate this, but first, I'm going to hold up your book. I, as I said, as we were preparing, this is a really great read. Um, and for students and other members of the NYU community, um, those of you who don't have background in terms of um, intelligence community issues, this is an incredibly great primer and gives you a great sense of history of how we got to where we are. And for those of you who like me, have a little bit more background in the intelligence community, it still is a great read um, because there's such a, it's such an interesting vantage point and you can read this book on so many different levels. So thank you very, very much for writing this and sharing it with us. And also I'm gonna dive right into questions because I know people want, want to hear from you and not me, but why don't you tell us a little bit about why you write the book now and um, how you came up with this wonderful title, which is, I think, very evocative of, the, of your theme. Well, thank you, Andrew, and thank you uh, to Trevor and uh, NYU Law School and the Reese Center. Let me just say a few things and I'll answer your question. Uh, first of all, let's start with the Reese Center, uh, the name Reese. Uh, for anyone who missed it, uh, Rick Reese is wonderful. The late Bonnie Reese, his wife and classmate uh, at NYU, was wonderful. And uh, my own daughter went to NYU Law School. Her name was Hillary Frank. It's now Hillary Peck. She graduated in 2003. I just figured this out. That was the year when Lauren Reese, daughter of Rick and Bonnie, married Brian Frank, uh, my 
my oldest child of four. And it's been a, a marvelous friendship and collaboration. And I'm just thrilled that, that Rick and I assume Bonnie too support the law school the way they do. It's a wonderful, wonderful school. And uh, Andrew, the fact that you like my book is mind blowing because you're a real lawyer. I call myself a recovering lawyer, also a recovering politician. Um, but that you read it and, and actually thinks I, I, I think I, I grappled with the, the hard issues, which I did try to do, uh, honors me. So thank you for that. Now, how did I get this title? So I have four children. I've just mentioned Hillary, the, the uh, NYU grad, Brian, the uh, uh, Harvard Business School grad. I have another son who is a Columbia Business School grad. And number four is my writer. And she does podcasts. Her name is Justine Harmon. And when she heard about this book, um, I, I don't think she's read it yet, but she said, Mom, what's the title? And I said, well, I think I'm going to call it The War on Terror Has Not Made Us Safe. And uh, that was basically the title of a debate I participated in at the Oxford Union, which prompted me to think about some of these issues. And I said, that's what I think I'm going to call it. Mother, that is so boring. Why don't you call it insanity defense? Aren't you saying that we haven't solved the hard problems? So it helps just saying to have a child who is a communications major and not a lawyer. Um, and I would, because I don't know that the other three would have come up with this. And it is, it does frame uh, what the book is about. Now, why did I write it now? Uh, I've been trying to write it for a long time. Uh, I wanted to write a policy memoir uh, that was about my years in Congress, which straddled 9-11, the decade before and, and part of the decade after. Uh, but as I think, as I thought about it, by the time I finished it, I added on another decade as the, uh, uh, as the head of the Wilson Center, and I was still confronting these problems. And bottom line, since the Cold War ended, uh, we have not had a strategy for what, came, what comes next or what came next. And because we never had a strategy over four presidencies, uh, we have made a lot of mistakes. We've gotten a couple of things right, but we don't have, we don't have uh, the magic formula to make America safer and the world safer. And in fact, I would argue that in many ways, the war is more dangerous uh, than, it, than it ever has been. So I wanted to, to follow up on that with some very spe some, some specifics that you address in the book and talk about um, things that you were really like integral to um, really making, I think, the US government better prepared. And I wanted to get your take on sort of the history of it and also how you think that's fared um, over time. So um, I wanted to start um, by discussing the Department of Homeland Security, which, you know, when, when I started out, there was no Department of Homeland Security. There was just a lot of different agencies um, and a lot of coordination issues. And I wanted to ask you sort of, um, how did that come about, the idea for it? And then um, get your assessment, sort of a scorecard of how you think it's worked um, what you think has worked well and what you would want to see do differently um, going forward to answer your question of like, how do we get out of the insanity defense, but looking at it through the lens of the Department of Homeland Security. Well, so, so to back it up a little, Cold War ends, I'm in the first post-Cold War class in Congress, 1992. Uh, at that point, we had downsized the defense and intelligence budgets, uh, meaning we had less money to spend on hopefully the right stuff to protect our country. And we did have less money. And I represented the Aerospace Center of California. So it was a gigantic employment issue in my district. Triple PhDs who had won the Cold War were out of work. Uh, in the 90s, Bill Clinton was our president. He didn't have a foreign policy background. Uh, and he focused on domestic issues. Um, the, the assault weapons ban passed on his watch. There were efforts to balance the budget. I was for all this stuff, by the way. Congress changed hands. Newt Gingrich became a very polarizing speaker uh, of the House. Uh, we worked on something called the contract on, uh, with America. Many of us called it the contract on America. But at any rate, we weren't focusing on uh, major terror attacks. Oh, by the way, does anyone remember the, the attack in the uh, parking level of the World Trade Center uh, in the early 90s? Two embassies of ours grew up in Africa. We weren't focusing on any of this. 
uh, and we certainly weren't investing in homeland security. So this is the background. Then we get to 9-11, uh, which in spite of the fact that a number of commissions, including one I served on, uh, predicted, had predicted a major attack on US soil, saying we were unprepared, happened. Major intelligence failure. And then uh, I sketch how we, how we responded in some ways correctly, in some ways incorrectly. Segue to Homeland Security, the Homeland Security Department. After 9-11, because I'm sure we'll go into some of the other stuff. Uh, after 9-11, many of us thought there ought to be basically a Homeland Security czar in the White House. Um, George W. Bush, who was president at the time, again, no foreign policy background, uh, but he, and he had delegated most of the foreign policy and defense functions to his vice president, Dick Cheney, who did have a background and had been Secretary of Defense and Chief of Staff to another president. But at any rate, uh, there was a homeland uh, czar, I don't think we, we use that term yet, uh, in the White House, a guy named Tom Ridge, former well-liked Republican governor of Pennsylvania. And he was trying to pull together uh, some kind of fo policy focus. We all felt in Congress that that role wasn't strong enough. It wasn't about Ridge, it was about not Ridge not having enough power. And we were working on giving him more power, possibly statutory power uh, on a bipartisan basis. Congress actually was still somewhat bipartisan back in the day, certainly after 9-11. And uh, out of basically nowhere came this gigantic proposal for a Homeland Security Department. It was authored by Andy Card, who was then the chief of staff to George W. Bush, Bush 43. And uh, I say in the book, we all believed when we looked at it finally, that it was designed to knock off the front pages a story that was highly embarrassing to your FBI. I don't know if you were there at the time, Andrew, maybe, which was a report who had observed that some folks uh, from the Middle East were taking flying lessons, but they weren't interested in taking off or landing, just flying planes. <laughs> anyway, her report had been, uh, okay. so focusing on the design of the department, it was, um, anyone would have thought, I bet Andy Card thought also, uh, enormous, 22 departments and agencies. Uh, with, you know, not necessarily under one roof. Reporting to 88 committees and subcommittees of Congress. So if you can even say that, you know how dysfunctional it was. But our hearty little band decided if Bush was for it, we ought to get on it. Uh, and it was our way to get the function improved. And so we worked on this bill. It ultimately became the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and it, it goes to show how, uh, you know, government works in, 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 in mysterious ways. And uh, in the net, I would say, and we can probe it, uh, it has been a positive, I would say. Um, one of the things that you detail um, in your book is the problem of turf in Washington. <laughs> and you deal with it both in terms of turf as it relates to agencies, but also turf as it relates to Congress and its committees. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, you know, which is just a fascinating insight. Anyone who's been to Washington knows that, uh, that can overtake substance. Um, what about um, the way in which there's oversight over department, the Department of Homeland Security? Do you think that's been, that it still needs to be worked on? Is it something that, that um, how would it benefit um, if you were, if you were you know, the next president and you could wave a magic wand, what would you do to sort of beef up that, that process? Well, I would take as many vitamins as I could take. I would then put on body armor and then I would roll a tank into Congress to try to do this and hope I would survive the other end of, the, of this process. But the problem is, and, and you know, you're, you're in an academic institution. Um, there are people there, uh, I'm sure they're all perfect, but they come with whatever they teach, they 
think that their, you know, their their office is the, their inner sanctum uh, rules. I have to do what? Uh, so uh, Congress, the committee structure of Congress, I think more or less was <laughs> developed in the in the 19th century. There is an agriculture committee. Nothing wrong with agriculture. It is a, a primary livelihood for a number of people in the United States, but certainly compared to homeland security uh, and uh, advanced technology, uh, oops, I wouldn't call it the, the primo. Uh, and so what happened was uh, we have a homeland department, we have to form homeland um, committees. Uh, I was on the original House Homeland Security Committee assigned to it, I think it was formed in 2004. Chris Cox, uh, a Republican, uh, the Republicans were in the majority, uh, who later headed the Security and Exchange Commission from California, was the chairman. And I remember he held a little uh, retreat in Maryland somewhere. And we all went, you know, how, what should we do with our committee? Okay, well-intended, bipartisan. Uh, I think that's great. However, we had to take our jurisdiction from other committees. That's my whole point. And uh, we took some. Uh, it's not that the Homeland Department does nothing. I mean, the Homeland Committee does nothing. There is actually a, a line item in the budget for the committee and for the Homeland Security Department and the committee oversees that. But so many things that really are directly relevant to Homeland Security are in other committees. And we tried and we tried. A guy named Benny Thompson of Mississippi was the ranking member at the inception and is still the chair of the committee, Democrat. And I remember <laughs> the, the conversations uh, about getting more uh, jurisdiction. Um, they didn't, they, they weren't paid. Well, yeah, they were painful because they didn't yield results. So um, that's where it is. So oversight is a little um, um, uh, limp, I would say, not because the people don't try, but because the jurisdiction isn't adequate. And, um, uh, I used to show a Where's Waldo chart of the 88 committees and subcommittees. The, the, the secretaries of Homeland that I have known all complained about how many places they had to, to testify uh, it, because, I mean, I can't say it's illegitimate. Congress really wants to know what up. So that's, that's the way it has worked. And uh, the 9-11 commission, um, does anyone remember that? We've been trying to get a 1-6 commission, which I am strongly for. But the 9-11 Commission, which was co-chaired by Lee Hamilton, uh, my predecessor at the Wilson Center and my mentor in Congress, um, recommended that uh, um, Congress reorganize uh, for the homeland function. And that is the largest recommendation of the 9-11 Commission that is still unfulfilled. Um, you anticipated something I wanted to talk about, which is the January 6th uh, events. Mm -hmm. and um, and your support for a uh, commission. Um, when, when you look at the Department of Homeland Security, which you know, its title itself suggests that you can look at January 6th as a huge black eye for that department, not, not them alone, but certainly um, as part of the, the main responsibility. But I was wondering how you look at it in terms of where, um, where you see, um, what, what the lessons are to you um, in terms of what happened and in terms of your, the work you had been doing in Congress at the Wilson Center? Well, um, that's why we need a 1-6 commission. Uh, it's a very you know, poetic name, I get that. Uh, but we really need the deepest dive into not just what happened, I think we know what happened, but why it happened. And I know a report came out yesterday, a bipartisan report in the Senate. And all I know is what I heard on the airwaves, and we all did, which is that uh, any reference to Donald Trump was deleted uh, and the term insurrection was deleted in order to get Republican support. I'm glad there was Republican support. There should be Republican support. Let's understand the Capitol uh, was attacked. Our, our seat of government was attacked and they weren't, the, the folks who were in there weren't selecting by party registration. I mean, they knew that Mike Pence was the vice president and they knew that Nancy Pelosi was the speaker, but I, I didn't hear in all the stuff we've seen, I didn't hear, let's just get Republicans or let's just get Democrats. And 
I've said for years that terrorists uh, won't check our party registration before they blow us up. So let's understand this was a, a bipartisan uh, national meltdown and our, our, our system of government was at risk. The only person not up there was the president of the United States. So I would like to know in much more depth uh, how this happened. And I, I could speculate, I think we all could, but I don't have the information. Uh, and uh, the report also, from what I again saw on the airwaves, uh, blamed our intelligence community for being slow to report or to get the reports heard at the highest level. Well, that, that happened on 9-11 also, um, but I think there's more to it. I think that there, from what I gather, and I'd love to see in detail uh, what, what some, you know, the, what the facts are. From what I gather, uh, some agencies of government, the National Guard itself was slowed down uh, to respond. So if that's true, uh, I think we ought to know that. And I, 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 you know, shout out to those Republicans who were trying to make this happen. One of them is Susan Collins, who's all over my book because she was my uh, basically partner in, in uh, passing the, the uh, 2004 reform of the intelligence community after two gigantic failures. And Susan worked her tail off to try to get to 10 Republicans who would support the 1-6 uh, commission in the Senate, and she couldn't get there. Um, one of the one of the uplifting and sad parts of your book is is the way that you speak about all of the people on the other side of the aisle who you worked with um, over the years. And um, but while you're candid about there are no halcyon days where every there was no politics involved, um, you certainly paint a picture where there is definitely more of a working together, particularly when it comes to the intelligence community and security issues. Well, right, yes. Porter Goss, who later became CIA director, was chairman when I was ranking member first. We worked closely together. And we even, it's in the book, uh, filed uh, some complaint about uh, the intelligence community moving too slowly. And then the next up, chair was a guy named Pete Huckstra, who worked very closely with me, conservative Republican from Michigan, who went on to be an ambassador in the Trump administration. Um, didn't mean we agreed on a lot of stuff, but we worked closely together on, on creating the, the office of the Director of National Intelligence. And uh, he bucked uh, the, the then chairman of the House Armed Services Committee and Vice President Cheney in supporting this. And it was enormously courageous. And uh, I, I, think, I think what you're supposed to do, at least what I try to do when you're elected to the United States Congress is put the country first. Yeah, uh, your party matters. And you know, I'm a card carrying Democrat. I've never said I was anything else and I don't wanna be anything else. Uh, but what I'm saying is country, country over party. Uh, for solving hard problems. And if we don't do that, which we are not doing at the moment, we're not going to solve the hard problems and the country is not going to get safer. And that is what I mean by insanity defense. We keep doing the same things and thinking we'll get a better result. Um, I wanted to turn to something I was so happy to read about in your book, which is the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board um, with a terrible name of PCLOB. Yeah. Um, and but it is such a wonderful um, group. When I was at the FBI, I was a huge fan of having that voice at the table. Um, and I was wondering if you could, since I think it's a very little known um, uh, group that was created, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, um, its history and also how you think it could be uh, used now. Well, I had a huge role in that. I'm not taking credit for lots of stuff, which other people thought of, but I actually thought of that. And the reason I thought of it was that I don't think privacy and security are a zero sum game or liberty and security are a zero sum game. It was uh, Ben Franklin who said, he that shall uh, or she mm, surrender uh, some uh, liberty for security deserves neither. I may have gotten that backwards, but you get the point. It's not a zero sum game, you have to have both. How do you have both? Well, as you are forming policy, you have to factor in both uh, and it's tricky. So my thought was have folks in the room 
who think about this exclusively and raise the issues on the front end of policymaking so that it is clear uh, uh, then uh, what the, tr the trade-offs could be or how to get to a positive sum. And uh, so the P Club, I, I don't know how it, <laughs> how, how we came up with that acronym, but by the way, the, the director of national intelligence was originally going to be the national intelligence director, and that, that acronym was NID, which sounded like a bug, so I got that change, but this one I, I missed. Uh, oops, I missed. But anyway, so um, that's what it was supposed to be. The trouble is that it has performed well episodically, and it has had some very good people, like the late Patricia Wald, whom I'm sure you know, who was chief judge, I think, of the DC circuit and was also on the, uh, in The Hague at the, uh, the National Criminal Court and was just a marvelous woman. Uh, and they've done some very good work, but most of the time the, the positions have been vacant. I don't even know if they're filled right now. Are they filled right now? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's up and running now. And, but it was when I was at the FBI and I just, mm -hmm. want, to, I just want to give you kudos because the idea of having that voice at the table at the yeah. end uh, uh, is really important. And it was really important also to know that there was going to be oversight by them and they were going to be asking those questions um, even if they weren't at the table at the, at the beginning. Um, and because it, it's so easy in the national security space to be concerned about security first and foremost without thinking about um, as deeply as one necessarily should right. privacy and civil liberties. Well, just to add, they, their, their halcyon days had to do with a couple of sections uh, of our surveillance uh, policy. And you know this. And <coughs> after the Snowden leaks, Everybody said, oh, we didn't know we had any of these things. Well, oops, Congress had actually debated some of this. Some of it wasn't under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, but we uh, were able to find out about it. You know, I'm sure you're going to ask me about what I would call the runaway executive in the early days of the Bush 43 administration in response to 9-11. But at any rate, uh, they did a lot of work thinking through whether these surveillance policies uh, were appropriate or not, and they were extremely helpful. Uh, in doing that. So um, one last sort of topic on and sort of reforms that, that came about all around the same time, the, the PCLOB, the D Department of Homeland Security, <laughs> and uh, it's a mouthful, but I'm used to my, my Washington days of using acronyms. Uh, they all come triple yeah. tongue now. Um, uh, talking about the uh, DNI, the, the formerly known as the, the NID. Um, so um, never, never. Formally proposed as the yes. DNI, we um, killed it. <laughs> so the uh, DNI. Um, so how do you think that is fared um, in terms of? Do you think um, you talk in your book a lot about sort of trying to get the dynamic right in terms of its oversight and also um, its relation to the CIA in particular? Yeah. And how do you think that is fared in terms of what you were trying to accomplish? Well, again, backing it up a little bit, um, the CIA and the management apparatus, such as it was, the Community Management Service for the intelligence community was created in 1947, no kidding, uh, uh, under the National Security Act. And I have always said that you know, no business in the world can survive with a 1947 business model, given all the changes. So it was a very outdated model. Uh, we had two massive intelligence failures, one on 9-11 and then one on the weapons of mass destruction estimate for, uh, that led us to the Iraq war, the, the WMD, uh, the national intelligence estimate on, on Iraq WMD was wrong. And I believed it at the time, which is why I voted for the Iraq war, which was a wrong vote based on wrong intelligence. But just saying, uh, a majority of Congress, including a lot of Democrats, believe that at Intel. So we'd had two massive failures. Uh, a big reason for that was uh, our failure to, this is the little acronym, or the little sound bite, connect the dots. Intelligence A didn't talk to intelligence B, didn't talk to intelligence C. And oh, by the way, that's the allegation right now in the report yesterday on the 1-6 uh, debacle that, that there wasn't sharing of information. At any rate, uh, 
fair, fair hit. And so we, uh, several important groups that were studying the problem recommended uh, a structure, a sort of joint command structure across the Intel com community. One of those groups was the 9-11 Commission. Another one was, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of this, it was the Joint Inquiry into 9-11. That's a very quaint name. This was, imagine that this actually happened, a meeting of all the members, all of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees under one roof, which was the dome of the Capitol, that's where our, our uh, rooms used to be, which by the way was probably the intended uh, 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 target of that fourth plane on 9-11, which went down in the field in Pennsylvania. But we all met in one room, which was hilarious because there was a big dais, it's a hearing room, but we couldn't fit all of us. So we had little ancillary plastic tables with, with uh, paper tablecloths. And I called the, those the kitty tables, you know, like at a kitty party. And, and what was good about that was I was at one of them. You really do good bonding with other people if you're sitting at a little kitty table for days. Anyway, everybody recommended a joint command structure across the intelligence community. Uh, 16 intelligence agencies, one six, I'm not making this up. Plus there were a lot, there are a lot of of uh, the tactical defense intel agencies, which we had to leave out because of opposition to including them. But the structure, the concept was similar to what was done uh, in the Pentagon in the 1980s, which was a, a law called Goldwater Nichols. Those were two members of Congress, Barry Goldwater, everybody has heard of, I'm sure nobody's heard of Nichols, but at any rate, that created the joint command structure in the Pentagon where the Army, Navy, uh, Air Force, and uh, Coast Guard uh, work under one structure with a joint commander uh, who rotates. And this was that. And we got there. And so now how has it worked? Well, you know, I have said 50% law, 50% leadership. And the leadership has been uh, well-intended always. I mean, people who tried hard, um, some more effective than others. Most people give the gold star to a guy named Jim Clapper, who was a former I guess three star, uh, who had the job for the longest. Uh, now we have the first woman, Avril Haynes, who's getting very good marks. But in between Clapper and Haynes, uh, we had a dark period where, um, best I could tell, the function was uh, redesigned basically to, to support whatever policy uh, the White House decided it needed. And that's death in terms of. Uh, of accurate intelligence. I mean, the, the role of the intelligence community is to speak truth to power, um, to sketch a set of predictions about the, the intentions and capabilities of our adversaries and our friends uh, designed to help policymakers make the best policy they can. And, um, uh, you know, the predictions aren't always right, but if they are uh, uh, designed to support a preconceived policy, they're not going to be right. And so I think we are now back to the, the, the better model. And I think our intel, so far as I can tell, I don't see classified intel these days, uh, is uh, we're you know, as, as good as we can field, so far as I know. So that, that, um, that relates to a topic you, you address throughout your book in, in, in fascinating ways, which is um, essentially to, to quote your, your one of your titles, which is the incredible shrinking Congress, um, which is the, the role of Congress, particularly as it relates to national security, um, really becoming diminished. Um, and certainly we've had that sense, uh, you know, not just under the Trump administration, but in, in right. the general. Um, and we talk about some of the political reasons for that in terms of the reality of taking a controversial vote, for instance, um, and, you know, why do that? Um, and relating it to this idea of, usually the history has been that Kipsy and Sissy, this sort of intelligence community side of the... Of the Explain, uh, your audience is going to have no idea what you just said, Andrew. Exactly. So, um, uh, Hipsy and Sissy, again, um, using Washington acronyms, I would say um, the House did better with its acronym than SISI, but basically the House um, Intelligence Committee is HIPSI, the Senate one is 
Sissy, there are other, um, as you, of course, delineated in your book, other um, committees that have a lot of um, uh, purview over intelligence. But in general, the view was that Hipsy and Sissy would be, was a, a place in Congress where you could go where there would be greater bipartisan support and, and views of things. And especially, I think, maybe because a lot of it haps, happens not uh, publicly, there was less grandstanding by everybody. I don't mean just the politicians, but also the, the agencies reporting to the... To, to mm -hmm. the um, but that one of the sad parts that you recount is that that certainly has deteriorated over time, maybe more on the House side than the Senate side. And the question for you is, how do we get back to a place that I think you would like to be, where intelligence is, um, you know, where people say, you know, patriotism and party sort of like that sort of can stop at the, the, the concern about party stops at the border. And, you know, yeah. and disease, you, you don't think that way. Well, uh, the, the Intel committees in the House and Senate were formed in the 1970s. I was then in the uh, Carter White House, and they were a response to the overreach of the Nixon administration, where, this may sound a little familiar, organs of government were used to spy on folks who were political foes. Oops, did that ever happen again? Hmm. At any rate, a guy named Frank Church, who was a uh, Democratic member uh, from New Mexico, anyway, uh, chaired the Church Commission. It recommended a series of reforms, one of which was that Congress would set up committees to oversee the activities of, in of intelligence. The committees were set up as leadership committees. This means that the leader of each party would appoint the people. It wouldn't go through the usual um, a process that each caucus has where it's kind of a, a vote to, to put people on committees. This would just be the personal purview of the leader. And the good news about that was that the leaders took it seriously and the membership of the committees was people who were very serious about intel. One of the things that would separate them from others is you really can't talk about anything you learn in a classified manner, or anything you read or anything you're briefed on. So it didn't have a lot of retail value uh, uh, politically. So you really had to be you know, pretty committed to this stuff. And in my case, oh, by the way, I represented, as I said, this district that made most of our intelligence, makes, still makes intelligence satellites. So this was dead center for me, uh, even if I couldn't talk about it. But over time, uh, alas, 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 the membership of the committees has been more politicized and the committees is, have been more politicized. And think Devin Nunes, a California member uh, on the House Committee, uh, ranking member, actually. A a um, uh, Adam Schiff is the chair. And some people think he's too political. I think he's, um, I think he has a hard job and I think he tries very hard. I do, personally. Someone's gonna throw a tomato at me through the Zoom screen uh, to get it right. But at any rate, Nunes, uh, no kidding, went down to the White House to get some of the stuff that he claimed somehow that he had found in the, in the committee. It was you know, a highly embarrassing moment. But so these committees are pretty politicized. Um, how do we get back to something better? Well, you could say, OK, the leaders ought to appoint the old fashioned folk who were more serious and more quiet. Well, how do they do that, given how politicized Congress is? Uh, if you're a leader, and this goes for Democratic leaders too, you have to get reelected by your caucus. Caucus is all the members of your party who are in Congress. Well, think about who's in these caucuses. It's kind of a broad spectrum, uh, far left, far right, fewer people in the middle. The middle has bailed um, by and large or been defeated, which makes it very hard for you to pick some middle of the road person. Number one, there may not be one, but number two, uh, the people on the far left and far right may strongly disagree with them. So um, what, what happens now? Um, we have to fix the business model. The business model of Congress is blame the other side because if you work with the other side, uh, you're bipartisan. And if you're bipartisan, guess what happens to you in your primary? And I had that happen to me three times. Uh, I won, but it was, you know, I was a traitor and a spy and I should be in jail and some people really think that or thought that maybe they don't anymore 
um, I hope not. I hope, I hope <laughs> enough time has gone by. But I, I, you know, I, as I said, I think the role of members of Congress is not to not have a party, but is to uh, put country over party, especially when national security is involved. I was wondering um, what your view was um, of either, um, these may sound contradictory, but either extending the term of people in the House so they're not sort of continually running or <laughs> um, having um, term limits either in the House or the Senate. And one, one uh, impetus for the question is one of the things that we saw over the last four years was um, a great deal of courage by people who were about to leave Congress. Um, yeah. They spoke <laughs> out, but they weren't running anymore. Um, and so uh, I was wondering if you thought there was some uh, potential institutional fix that may, especially given all of your experience in Congress, that, you, that might make this, um, might help the problem uh, be resolved. Well, either of the things you have suggested, lengthening terms or term limits, would require a constitutional amendment. And I am very leery given our hugely divided politics of opening the constitution. I think, you know, there's a whole bunch of folks who might not want to have one anymore. And I'm still holding out uh, for the concept of our founders, the separation of powers. And I think it's a, an amazingly brilliant idea. It doesn't mean it works that well, but it's a brilliant idea and I remember, I guess it was Franklin again, or that we have a republic if we can keep it. And uh, democracy is an overused term, and there are demo democratic votes in you know the Soviet in Soviet Union in Russia and all over the world. And I don't think uh, that that's enough of a marker of the kind of free society we want. So I think our constitution sketches that. As for longer terms, it is called the. The House is called the perpetual election. You just keep running. Uh, as soon as it's over, you thank your contributors and hit them up. Uh, it takes so much money because, again, uh, Supreme Court decisions, which you know about, uh, and um, uh, have, have, have encouraged the unlimited donation to these super PACs of money from both labor unions and corporations. And it's astounding how much money there is. So. Uh, I have just been back to Susan Collins. She says that she raised $20 million in her last race for the Senate in this last cycle and a hundred million dollars, a hundred million dollars was spent against her. Uh, most of it out of state that apparently backfired. But the point is a hundred and twenty million dollars could go a long way to help some of these folks who have been just devastated in the pandemic. And you, you think about just where our priorities are. So, I mean, we have to fix the, the money in politics. We have to fix uh, the way districts are drawn, gerrymandering. I think everybody understands that. Uh, California's done a pretty good job. I, of course, from California, uh, but we have citizen commissions drawing the, the congressional lines. We have to fix, these are things we can do without amending the constitution. Uh, we have to fix uh, very partisan primaries. California has a jungle primary where everyone runs against each other. At any rate, I'm against amending the Constitution for these things. I also voted for term limits in uh, in uh, state in the state legislature in California some years back, which now exists. And I watched uh, the kind of rotating membership where people it took people a few years to get acclimated, and then they were out in four years. And who ran the place? The staff, and who elected the staff? So I would say. Uh, we're better off having people, having voters decide, and hopefully finding a way to get more voters in the process. We may be going the other direction with respect to a lot of state laws, getting more voters into the process uh, so that uh, we really can have a referendum on whether somebody's doing a good job or not. So we have to take a slight break for a commercial. <laughs> um, so there is CLE for uh, the people who are attending uh, this wonderful talk. And we've come to the point where I think somebody is going to flash on screen the code, that this is the code that you need to write down and then uh, the 
uh, folks at NYU have a form for you to fill out and here's the code for you. So RCLS3926. So thank you very much, but let's get back to our show. <laughs> um, so, well done, Andrew. That was well done. Thank you. So um, uh, one of the things that I found um, remarkable um, in your book was um, the process of um, the executive briefings to um, the to Congress oversight committees, and um, I can tell you when I was at the FBI serving under Director Mueller, that was something we took unbelievably seriously because um, there was a view that Congress was entitled to answers, um, and it was a very yeah serious process and um, we wanted to make sure we got everything right and we gave you answers. One of the things that you recount was that to me, you recount a story where there's almost a gotcha, where if you did not ask exactly the right question, then you did not get the answer. Um, so one of the one of the stories you tell is about Stellar Winds, the um, a very controversial uh, program within the intelligence community and um, that you had assumed that for, I would think, very good reason that this was all brought within the court system. But, um, and I, I know people later faulted Congress, but my view is that you shouldn't have to ask that question. Um, and how do we, um, and obviously we've lived through a period where there is a sense of not reporting at all and just flouting the oversight responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, how if at all would you change that so that you're, you're not in that position where um, you have to, it's like a game of um, battleship where you, you know, you, t you have to sort of guess the, the, the right number and, and yeah. order in order to see where things are. Well, uh, I, I had, I think my worst experience was on the Intel committee. Um, in other committees in open session, you could ask more broad ranging questions of cabinet secretaries, as an example. Um, even, you know, secretaries of defense, for example, I was on armed services, as you pointed out. Um, and they might not answer, but they would never say, uh, I, I that, that's not in my lane. In intelligence, at least back, in my day, and this was after we did intelligence reform too. It, it was 20 questions. That's what Pete Huckstra called it. If you didn't ask exactly the right question, you wouldn't get, you know, somebody would say, well, I, I don't know anything about that. And so I kept asking for higher level briefers who knew more than, you know, one thing from one silo. And that was scary, by the way, that people were still siloed within intelligence uh, agencies. I mean, the whole goal here is uh, to share enough information so that you get an accurate profile of whatever it is that you're trying to, to understand. And if you don't share, if you hoard, uh, we used to talk about the, the difference between need to know and need to share. If you hoard and if, if information's overclassified, you might ask me that too. Uh, that was something else, another one of my rants. Um, you, you don't get to a place where you have the right information, the right truth, for the policymakers, but um, so these hearings were very frustrating. And uh, the one you're talking about was not a hearing. I was a member of the so-called Gang of Eight that still exists. That is the senior, the the chair and ranking member of the Intel committees plus the leadership of Congress. You know, uh, majority and minority. That's eight people. The Gang of Eight, and we are uh, entitled to briefings on the most classified covert actions of the United States. And in that capacity, I was briefed on this Stellar Wind program. Looking back on it, that it was in the wrong place. Stellar Wind was not a covert action of the United States. You could argue, maybe you would think that, we could have that conversation. But it was a surveillance program. Uh, it was classified, but uh, at least I, as I remember it now, I don't think it met the definition. But we're briefed on this program. It was later disclosed. It had to do with uh, metadata. That's your, you know, phone logs. It doesn't say what you said 
you know, if Andrew and I were talking, not what we said, but it, the fact that we had a phone call and the duration of that call would show up in a phone log. And it had to do with the government collecting some of this data. Uh, why? Because, uh, and this is all now public, the, the idea was if we found a dirty phone number, so-called dirty phone number in a foreign country uh, belonging to a foreigner, a non-US person, and that phone number were chained, that person called another person who called another person who called me or Andrew, that would be discovered. And then we would be possibly the subject or target of uh, investigation because maybe we were uh, conspiring with a, terror, a foreign terrorist to attack the US. Anyway, that was the idea of it. Turned out it was pretty feckless and it didn't get very far. But the point was, I was in these highly classified meetings in the White House or the Situation Room in the basement of the White House, uh, being briefed by somebody like the Vice President or uh, Mike Hayden, who was then um, at the Pentagon. I don't know if he was in the White House or the Pentagon, but he later became uh, uh, CIA head of the, uh, I don't even remember anymore, uh, CIA director and deputy national intelligence, deputy uh, DNI, deputy national God, Deputy DNI, that's what both of those roles. Anyway, I kept asking, is this program in full compliance with US law? Answer, yes. So I assumed, because I couldn't check on anything or talk to anybody, that it was in full compliance of the basic law that affects this called uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, which had passed in the late 70s as part of setting up the Intel committees, which I already talked about. I, I assumed it was in full compliance with FISA. Well, later when the program was revealed, Snowden leaked it and a lot of other stuff. I have no, no uh, affection for Snowden. I think he was did very dangerous things. Uh, but Snowden leaked it. Uh, Bush uh, 43 partially declassified it. I then could call uh, for outside help. And I spoke to a guy named Jeff Smith who had been the general counsel of the CIA. And he you know, basically said, this program does not comply with FISA, it clearly doesn't. They must be talking about something else. And what was the something else? The something else was an opinion written by the Office of Legal Counsel in the Justice Department. So they got their own legal opinions so that they could call their programs legal. They didn't report them to Congress in any broader sense, and they didn't comply with federal law. And th this is a big part of the book. And there was an effort to bring this program, change it, and bring it under uh, uh, under uh, uh, full compliance with federal law. And it was debated, even though some people say they still never heard of it. Uh, but but the point is that we, we went to the dark side after 9-11 in many ways, and Congress was cut out. And I think that's terribly wrong, and really a, uh, a, a chapter we, we should never repeat. We made a lot of mistakes doing that, and having a vibrant Congress alongside a, a, you know, a creative and, and, and well-staffed uh, executive branch. I can think of you, Andrew, as one of the people who should, well, who was there, but you know, you're the kind uh, is, is what we need. Plus a, a vibrant court system is what we need to keep this country uh, in, in the place that it represents, uh, that, that, that it will be safest. So um, uh, I wanted to get your views on something that we've seen uh, and relates to your last answer. Um, in the last few years, um, and this is, I, I, you know, you're at a law school where we have a lot of law students who are, are listening in um, and obviously a lot of lawyers. Um, and we've seen in the last few years, something pretty remarkable. We've seen various people in the Department of Justice uh, resign. Uh, yeah. with awesome cases. We've seen the acting attorney general decline to enforce a law she thought was unconstitutional. We've seen the former White House counsel um, uh, offer to resign rather than carry out uh, something that the president uh, you know, reportedly wanted to do in, in firing the special counsel. Um, so there, there are a number of instances where lawyers have um, sort of looked into their hearts and souls. And I was wondering what you viewed, whether we're talking about the executive or the congressional branch, what you viewed the role of the lawyer is, particularly as it relates to 
the intelligence community, how you think the lawyers should responsibly act um, in carrying out their duties to the, their client uh, and the public? Well, I, this has been a sad chapter. Uh, I recall uh, in the early 70s, uh, 1973, the so-called Saturday Night Massacre, uh, which for anyone who was born then or could, could possibly remember you know, another century, uh, had to do with Archibald Cox, who had been a professor at Harvard Law School. I attended Harvard Law School. I was a fairly recent graduate of Harvard Law School then, um, doing an investigation of Watergate uh, with a sterling group of people. I think, as I recall, that his committee was set up by the Attorney General as a, as a justice, you would know better than I. But at any rate, uh, Richard Nixon didn't like this and decided to, fi to fire Cox and he called the Attorney General, then Elliot Richardson, another Harvard product, I think, uh, uh, also from Massachusetts, and instructed him to fire uh, Cox. And, and Richardson refused and he resigned. And then he called uh, Nixon, or the White House called the Deputy AG, a guy then named Bill Ruckelshaus, as I remember, and asked him to do it. And he refused and he resigned. And then ultimately they went down the chain and uh, a guy called Bork, somebody may have heard of him, um, uh, who was, I think, the Solicitor General finally fired um, uh, Cox. And it was called, the, it, I guess it, it was on Saturday night. And I was this young lawyer working for a California senator in the Senate. I, my first child had just been born. And I went out on my porch in Washington, D.C., and I expected to see rifle fire. I really did. And uh, I thought our government was becoming unglued. The good news is it didn't, and, and we survived. Segue to what's gone on more recently, including 1-6, which was far more dangerous when you think about it than Saturday Night Massacre, and including this slew of lawyers who were directed to do things they felt violated their oath uh, and their conscience. And good on them. I mean, I'm not saying every one of them was right, but I think uh, speaking to lawyers on this call, uh, if we don't have a conscience, I don't know what we do have. Uh, you know, we, I, I, I respect an organization like the ACLU for taking unpopular positions and arguing them on behalf of clients. I respect that, uh, I do. Um, but I don't respect a lawyer crossing a personal line that he, she, thinks is unethical. Uh, I don't respect that at all. And I think we've seen that. And fortunately, not everybody did it. And, you know, um, uh, I hope we don't see that again anytime soon. And, um, you know, are my ethics your ethics? No. Uh, but I think in law schools, there is a focus on this. I certainly recall it back in the dark ages that there was. And uh, I would like to think that in politics too, there are things I would not do and I did not do. And if I thought something, uh, you know, can I give two examples really quickly? Do we yeah. have time? Yeah. One of them was um, the Defense of Marriage Act. It was, that was what, what it was called. And it, it was a law that was debated in the nineties that said states do not have to recognize uh, the, the uh, marriage conducted in another state. Uh, it was designed to uh, uh, authorize states to block gay marriage. And um, there is the, the contracts clause in the, in the Constitution. And I, you know, and, and more that I'm not remembering very well, but I, I read all this at the time. And I said, this is unconstitutional. I'm not going to vote for this. Uh, and I didn't vote for it. There were only 83 votes against it. And when I was getting ready to put my card in the slot. I mean, had made it clear how I felt. Um, a leader of Congress then came running over to me and said, are you sure you ought to do this? You're in a lean Republican seat. It's very conservative and people are gonna really be upset with you. And I said, yes, because I took an oath to support the, con to support the constitution and this is unconstitutional. And it later, you know, years later, the Supreme Court agreed. But the other story is bad on me, which is, uh, and it's in the book. I went to Guantanamo Bay the first time. Uh, I went there four or five times. And this is when we had hastily set up this prison. Uh, and we basically had people in orange jumpsuits in wire cages. I, this is true that we did this. Um, 
<laughs> and I was crossing the little body of water from the airfield to the prison with uh, a, a three star and, and a few other members. And I asked the guy, why was this prison set up here? And he said, to be beyond the reach of US law. Now, come on folks, that, that's not plausible. And I didn't think it was. Uh, and what did I do? Nothing. Why? It was shortly after 9-11. I thought maybe, maybe there's something I'm missing. Maybe there's some wrinkle and he doesn't understand, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, years later, the Supreme Court was there too. And I'm not saying that I'm, you know, I'm always right. But these are things that you just know are wrong. And yet you should act. And I should have said something. Uh, would it have changed the course of U.S. history? Maybe not, but you know, I would have felt better about myself if I had. Congresswoman, we are out of time, and I want to thank you on behalf of the Reese Center and NYU both for taking the time to talk with us, but also writing this book. Let me put it up again. Uh, for those of you <laughs> who enjoyed this, this is just a tidbit of what you can read about in much more detail. Um, and the same candor um, that you saw today, you will see on every single page of this book. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to speak with us. Well, to everybody out there, um, make the world a little better. You're highly skilled. Figure out where you need to be to do that. Uh, and Andrew, you have done that. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly Bob Mueller has done that, tried his hardest. Kudos to Bob, and uh, whom I met when he became FBI chair, uh, director, right, right around 9-11 and worked with closely. And uh, others at the school and to my dear friend and co-grandparent, Rick Reese, you've invested your money wisely. This is a very good program. Thank you all.